I think there's a lot of merit in the saying that project management is 80% communication. So in this video, I want to talk about how to build a great communication plan. If your project doesn't tell people as much as they want to know, if you don't keep communication ahead of events, then people will fill the vacuum with rumour. When people don't have any real information and they find out what's going on through gossip and rumour, then they lose confidence. They feel as if nobody's in control because rumour loves exaggeration and gossip creates alarm. The information we get from ill-informed sources is always more scary than reality. In some people's minds, change plus uncertainty equals conspiracy. It seems ironic that it was John F. Kennedy who said, the great enemy of the truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive and unrealistic. An important part of your role on a project is to quash the rumours and the way we do this is by communicating and communicating well. In fact, there's an argument that says you can never communicate enough until that point where people go, it's too much. So you need to build effective communication plans. The basic form of project communication plan is a table, a matrix, a set of columns. And the easiest tool to use to create your communication plan is either a table in a document or in a spreadsheet. In this table, each row represents a new line of communication and we use the columns to tell ourselves what we need to know about each communication that we're planning to put out. A simple communication plan may only have a few columns with the core information. A more thorough, robust communication plan may have up to nine or even more columns. I'm going to take you through the nine columns I consider most important and to help you remember them, to bring them to mind when you're out there doing your job, I'm going to give each column a title that begins with T. And the first column is T for theme. For each communication, think about the theme of that communication. What's it about? And the second column is T for topic. What are you actually going to say? You could also think about this as T for tale, the tale you're going to tell, the story, the message itself. The next column is T for target. Who is this message aimed at? Who needs to receive this message to understand this topic, to listen to this tale? This may be multiple stakeholders, or it may be a simple communication aimed at one stakeholder in particular. The next thing to think about is T for tool. What is the medium you're going to use to communicate this message? For each stakeholder and for each message, there are going to be some tools, some media that will work better than others. There may not be a single optimum, but think through What's the appropriate medium to use for this stakeholder to receive that message? And the next T is T for tone. Are you going to be consultative, informative, commanding, demanding, requesting, requiring, or simply telling a story? Are you looking to gain information back from your stakeholders? Are you looking to gather their opinions, their ideas, their advice? 
Or are you looking to tell them something or ask them something or ask them to do something or request them to do something or require them to do something? Tone of voice is really important. And we've all had that experience of sending out a message and getting a reply that was wholly other than what we expected. The words were right, but the way we expressed them, the tone of voice in our message was wrong. If in planning your communication, you think about the tone of voice you want, then when you've drafted your communication, when you've prepared it, you can review it critically against that required tone of voice. And if you've ever sent out an email late at night when you're a bit frustrated and got a horrible reply the next morning, you'll know the importance of checking your messages for tone. Next is timing. Some communications follow a regular cycle like project reports. Others come at specific times. So what is the correct timing? If it's a regular communication, then what's the frequency? If the project's going to evolve, how might that frequency evolve through the life of the project? If it's a one-off communication, when's the best time to issue it? Think about the project events. Think about what the stakeholder is going to be concerned with. The ideal time from the point of view of your project may not be ideal from the point of view of a stakeholder. If they've got urgent considerations, then sending a message at that time may mean it doesn't get properly read, may not get read at all, and it certainly may not get the consideration that you want for it. We all get overloaded at times, so think about your stakeholders and their business cycle. At number seven, it's T for test. How are you going to test to measure that your communication has been effective and achieved what you want of it? This is about how you're going to gather feedback, how you're going to assess the feedback and arguably what feedback you want. What is a good result? Tests can be as structured as sending a questionnaire or asking for a reply or they can be as unstructured as observing the expression on the face of your stakeholder when you tell them something in person. But think about how you're going to be sure that the communication you have sent into the world has had the result that you want, and crucially, how you're going to spot if it hasn't. Number eight is the teller, the person who is going to create the message. Who is responsible for each line of your communication plan? And finally, at number nine, T for tick. Who is going to be the person who signs off the communication before it goes out? Now, some communications won't need that sign off. The person who you allocate to take responsibility for it can sign it off and do it themselves. But others are going to be crucially important. It may be your responsibility as project manager. It may be a stream lead. It may be a communication manager. It may be someone as senior as the client representative or the project sponsor who needs to authorize a communication before it goes out. Thinking about this is an important part of good project governance. So there we have it. Nine important considerations for any communication and therefore the basis of a robust project communication plan. But sometimes you need something more for particular stakeholders. You will have identified some stakeholders as absolutely crucial to the success of your project, your key stakeholders, your apex stakeholders, however you want to describe them. So you may want to build a specific communications plan for those individual stakeholders. So for each stakeholder, you will start your communications plan by articulating what you know about that stakeholder. Crucial information about who they are, their roles, their responsibilities, and perhaps their communication preferences. You'll also think about who is best placed to communicate with that stakeholder, who already has a relationship with them, and how does that relationship work? You may also want to think about people who are not well-placed communicate that stakeholder. Next, think about what you know about them. And in particular, what is their stance towards the project? 
Are they supportive? Are they antagonistic? Are they considering their position? And how much power and influence do they have? It's likely because they're a key stakeholder that they'll have quite a lot of influence, quite a lot of power. And what is your strategic stance towards that stakeholder? What do you want to achieve with them? Do you want to achieve support, active promotion of your project, or do you want to learn from them and get their input to make sure the project works well? Next, think about the key messages you'll need to get across to them and perhaps schedule them out over time as you expect the relationship to evolve and the project to progress. And think about the communication media that you'll want to use with that stakeholder. Although you've already thought about who has the relationships and who doesn't, nominate someone to take responsibility as the point person to mark that stakeholder and to stay in contact with them, to give that stakeholder a point of contact in the project should they need to. And because you're likely to be considering important key stakeholders, make sure that person is someone that they will consider suitably important for them to speak to. You may want to include a budget for communicating with that stakeholder and then Crucially, schedule out line by line the communications you expect to make. And this part of your stakeholder communication plan will, of course, evolve with the project. You can use the nine T's, but if you want to keep it simpler, what I consider to be the most important information in your line by line breakdown of communications with that stakeholder are the message, the medium, the tone, the timing, and the person who is going to prepare and initiate that communication. So we've gone through two of a number of communication tools, but the two most useful, the two most widely used, and therefore the two most effective communication tools that you can use on your project. If project management truly is 80% communication, and I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that to a first approximation it is, then great project communication and a great project communication plan is an essential component of your project management. As a result, use these two plans in your next project, make them part of your toolkit, and you'll become a better project manager. As a project professional, who wouldn't want to be influential? Who wouldn't want our colleagues to view us as wise, to see us as someone with real gravitas? So what are 10 ways you can make a real impact with your ideas? To say to people, my ideas are worth noting. Number one is space. We all have a bubble of space around us, almost a kind of aura. We know that when we're with other people, there's a kind of distance that we don't encroach upon inappropriately. Interestingly, our sense of space affects the way people perceive us. So if you can mentally visualize your bubble just expanding outwards a little bit so that mentally you're occupying more space, that psychological effect inside your mind will somehow communicate itself to other people as they sense your increased confidence in the space you occupy. And that will give them the impression that you're someone with confidence and therefore someone worth listening to. Number two is to slow down because people with gravitas don't need to rush. And of course, if you slow your speech down, people can understand you more clearly. They have more time to think about your words. And critically, you have more control over your breathing. Why does that matter? It matters because when we speak quickly and excitedly, we don't get quite enough breath. And therefore, our vocal cords start to contract and our voice rises up through its registers. When we speak slowly, our voice settles to its natural register. And most human beings will interpret a lower 
more natural sounding voice as a sign of confidence and authority. A side tip, number two and a half if you like, is to also keep the volume of your voice down. People lacking authority and lacking confidence need to shout to get attention. But if you've got real confidence and real authority, you can speak quietly so that other people feel the need to lean in and listen to what you're saying. Third, think small. Big movements convey charisma. Big words convey intellect. Big speeches convey status. But small movements convey economy. Small words convey understanding. Small speeches convey moments of deep insight. Wise people do and say relatively little. But what they do say conveys a lot. There's a time for big, but when you want to convey authority, gravitas and wisdom, think small. Fourth, be still. Stillness conveys a special quality in today's frenetic world. If you can cultivate the ability to be still, it will distinguish you from the rest of the busy, busy, rush, rush world around you. It would also convey a sense of weight. The word gravitas is the Latin word for weight. Stillness conveys authority. Fifth, summarize. Smart people will always jump in to make sure that their ideas are heard. But wise people will wait. They will listen to all the ideas. They will evaluate them and synthesize them into a deeper insight. They will summarize what they have heard, drawing out the important elements and making sure that they focus on what really matters. Sixth, silence. The ultimate in slowing the pace of your speech is silence. And one of the things I have found is that in any conversation, the person who is most comfortable with silence will have a natural advantage in that conversation. Silence is difficult because people aren't comfortable with it. But the ability to listen in silence and to hold a silence while you think through what you've heard demonstrates deep thought and insight. And when someone has finished speaking, don't just jump in. Pause. Wait. Revel in the silence. And only when you've got complete silence do you speak. That way, there is only one person to listen to, and that's you. Number eight is attention. Have you noticed that when you speak to most people, after a while, their attention starts to wander? Their eyes will start to look over your shoulder, or maybe over your other shoulder. They'll be looking around the room or around their environment to see if there is something else that they could or should attend to. If you want people to really value you for your authority, for your wisdom, then make sure that you keep your attention 100% on them. That way they will start to feel that they are important to you. They will value that and be ready to listen to you when it's your turn to speak. Ninth is process. A smart professional will have the answers to almost all the questions. But a wise professional will know that they can never have the answer to every question that emerges because with their experience, they're working at the leading edge. So what's the answer? The answer is not to have the answer to the question, but to recognize the process for getting it. If there is a problem to be solved, the wise people are not the people who have an instant answer. They're the people 
who can pause and develop a process for moving forward and resolving the problem. If you don't know the answer clearly from your experience, then focus on the process to find, evaluate, and test the answer. And finally, number 10 is tone. In any environment, whose demeanor matters most? It's the person that everyone takes their cue from. Be that person who sets the tone. Read the room, understand the context, and adapt your tone so that you can lead people to adopt the right demeanor for the situation. These ideas are taken from my course on how to build Gravitas and from my book Smart to Wise, which is unfortunately out of print. But How to Build Gravitas is a short course that is available from the website. And if you look in the description below, you'll find a discount coupon so that you can access it today at a reduced price. You'll get better project results when you stop using telegrams. Whoa, hang on a moment. I'm too young. I have no idea what telegrams are. Don't worry. It's just a metaphor but it's an important one to understand for all project managers. Stop using telegrams. Okay, it's a metaphor and I'm exaggerating. But too many project managers seem to act as if they are in the days of telegrams. Project, underperforming, stop. Must speak to stakeholders, stop. Send progress report by Wednesday, stop. In the days of telegrams, every word cost money. And therefore, in sending a telegram, the skill was to be short, concise, and precise. Telegrams never wasted a word. The person who sent it thought all about the message and nothing about the person on the other end. They were just a passive recipient of the key facts. And that's still how far too many project managers seem to work. They send out information to their team, to their stakeholder, to their governance tier. In a form of communication, I call me to you communication. And of course, it's important to get the facts out. I'm not denying that. But there's more to communication than me sending a message to you. I need to think about how you're going to receive that message and the message you will want to get to me. As a project manager, your job is to encourage two-way communication from me to you and from you to me. But even that alone is not enough. That's a hub and spoke model of communication where you, the project manager, are the hub and everyone else is on the rim. They're receiving your communications and they're sending stuff to you. That is not good project communication because it creates a very palpable single point of failure. If the hub fails, communication fails and the project will fail. Project communication is phenomenally important, so you have to take it super seriously. You have to make time to ask good questions, to listen hard and to reflect upon it. And you have to create a culture where everybody in your team does exactly that. They ask good questions and they listen to and reflect upon the answers they receive. If there's one thing that you can do to get better project results, it is almost certainly to improve communication in, on and around your project. And simple telegram communication with just the facts will not cut it. A former colleague of mine named Judith used to call this black and white communication. But Mike, she used to say, the world is multicolored. And if you confine your communication to black and white and to shades of gray, you will not capture the subtlety of the situation on a complex project. And she was absolutely right. Manage your people, manage your stakeholders, 
and manage your project through communication. To a first approximation, project management is all about good communication. Some accounts will tell you that project management is 80% communication. Others will tell you it's even more. So clearly communication is an important part of our role as project managers. And one of the most important aspects of communication is making what you say, what you write, what you communicate memorable. In this video, we're going to look at how to make your project communications memorable for your team members and your stakeholders. When you communicate with your stakeholders, your ideal message will be compelling, persuasive, and powerful. What do I mean by compelling, persuasive, and powerful? Well, let's start with compelling. What I mean by compelling is firstly, that your communication has to draw your listener or your reader in. They have to want to engage with it and Compelling also means that having drawn them in, they want to stick with it. They want to continue to watch your video, to listen to your podcast, to read your communication, or to listen to you. But the other aspect of compelling is that what you communicate has to be understandable. The person who is reading or listening to your communication has to understand what you're saying and communicating but that's not enough. Your communication also needs to be persuasive. And that has two elements to it as well. Firstly, it's not enough that your listener or your reader needs to feel that they understand what you're saying. They have to understand what you're communicating in the way that you intended. Therefore, you have to craft your communication in such a way that not only do they feel they understand it, but the message they get from it is the one that you intend. But crucially, for your communication to be persuasive, they have to be persuaded. They have to agree with what you're saying. They have to understand and concur with your key messages. But compelling and persuasive isn't enough. Your communication also needs to be powerful. And there are two elements to that. The first, of course, is that your communication has to spur change. It has to get people to want to do something or to change their point of view or to modify their behaviors. That goes without saying. But the other thing I think that is important, because let's face it, it's very hard to change our point of view or modify our behaviors or do something if we don't remember. Powerful communication is communication that sticks in the mind. And that's fundamentally what this video is all about. Because there are five easy to remember ways to make your communication memorable. But before we look at those five ways, it's important to note why I have chosen to go with five. And the answer is in Miller's magic number. Seven plus or minus two. Because what Miller found was that people can tend to remember lists that are between five and nine items long. Some people have a prodigious memory and can remember more. And some people, of course, really struggle for various reasons and can't remember as many. But most people's memory for items in a list is seven plus or minus two items. But you don't want to assume that the person you're communicating with is towards the top end. Seven, eight, or nine. Better to assume that they're towards the bottom end and make it easy for them. And that's why I prefer to give you five items in my list. And then, because there are other things, to subdivide one of those items to make that memorable too. So, with no further ado, what is the first way to make something memorable? Well, it's the primacy factor. We tend to remember the first piece of information we receive. That's why people say it's important when you're presenting something to tell them what you're going to tell them. 
because that way you start to create a primacy hook. Think about when you went to parties at a younger age, or maybe you still do. Often when you meet new people, you don't remember them all. But you often remember the first person you meet when you go to a party, that first person who welcomes you in and you start talking with. That's the primacy effect at play. The second way to remember something is the opposite of the primacy effect. It's the recency effect. The most recent piece of information that you hear sticks in your mind. And when you go to a party, the last person you see before you leave the party will probably stick in your mind too. That's the recency effect. The third way to make something memorable is with frequency. The frequency effect is the fact that we remember things that we hear or see or experience time after time after time. If you go to a party and you keep bumping into the same person, then they are likely to stick in your mind after the party. Fourth, the novelty effect. If you can make a piece of information surprising or novel or unusual in some way, you enhance its memorability. Describing something as a short list of things is a way to give it novelty. Using acronyms like my SPECTRES acronym for the types of risk we encounter is a good way to introduce novelty. Or perhaps changing the colour of the shirt you're wearing when you describe the novelty effect will make it stick. Yes, you can pull stunts, but you don't want information to stick for the wrong reason. However, if you're presenting a lot of information with PowerPoint and it's all bullet points and you want something to stick, then present that piece of information with a diagram or a graph, something that is different. And if you're using mixed PowerPoint for your whole presentation and you want something to stick with a novelty effect, then perhaps use a printed board or a demonstration of some sort to give it that novelty factor. The fifth way to get something to stick is activity. And this comes in three flavours. The first, of course, is physical activity, motion. If you can get somebody to do something, to actively process that information through physical movement, through trying something out with their, with their hands, with their bodies, then it is more likely to stick. The second version of activity is mental activity. If you can ask them a question and force them to process it, or if you can set them a problem, or if you can ask them to fill in a form, if you can ask them to describe what you've said to another audience, all of that mental activity will help something to stick too. And finally, there is emotional activity. If you can trigger someone's emotional responses, then the information is likely to stick. Bald statistics do not impress everyone, but often the stories, the individual human stories behind them do. So activity is a combination of physical motion, physical activity, mental activity, processing if you like, and emotion, emotional reaction to what you want. So, to utilise both the frequency and the recency effect, let me remind you of the five ways you can make your information memorable. You can use the primacy effect, the recency effect, the frequency effect, the novelty effect, and the activity effect. And with those five tips, you can make your project communication memorable. Project management can demand some difficult conversations. So in this video, I want to give you five tips to help you with challenging communication. Tip number one is to have a plan and to trust the process. Before you go into the conversation, have a plan. Think about how you're going to conduct that conversation. And primarily, think about outcomes. And the most important thing to think about is what is your ideal outcome from this dialogue? 
but also think about the range of acceptable outcomes, the outcomes which for you will give you a result that you can live with. That way you can design a process for the communication that will drive towards the acceptable outcomes, ideally to hit your ideal outcome, but also one which will spot blockers along the way or side turnings so that you can avoid ending up with an undesirable outcome. There are a number of practical and effective processes that you can lift off the shelf. And I describe one of them in our ebook on challenging communication. More about that later. Tip number two is all about timing. Have your challenging conversations as soon as you can, but no sooner than you should. For most difficult, challenging communication, the ideal time to have that conversation is as soon as possible. But of course, although difficult messages can get more difficult as time goes on and delaying won't do you any favors, it's certainly a mistake to go in to any difficult communication circumstance not fully prepared, or indeed to start a challenging conversation when the emotional temperature is too high, either for yourself or for the other person. And that's why I say no sooner than you should. Think about the ideal timing and get as close to it as you possibly can. Tip number three, being right is less important than the outcome. So be prepared to take it on the chin. Be prepared to give the other person a win, to credit them with the idea that makes a breakthrough. It's more important that you get that breakthrough, that you get the outcome that you want than it could ever be to feel good about yourself and how clever you are and how wise you were. If the other person goes away thinking they got the outcome they wanted, they created the dialogue, then as long as you've got the outcome you wanted, that's absolutely fine. And they'll feel good and they'll feel good about you and everything will be excellent. As a side tip, I want to suggest to you the best way to be right as often as possible, which is to notice as soon as you're in danger of being wrong and to stop and change your attitude. Fess up to your mistake, say you're sorry, put things right and move on. Because if you're not prepared to make changes, then inevitably you're going to be wrong some of the time. If on the other hand, you're always prepared to detect when you're in danger of being wrong and to change your mind, to change your approach, then you can be right pretty much all the time. Tip number four is all about the power of you and I. The words you or your or yours, any of those words which denote the other person in the conversation are enormously powerful. So are the words I and me and mine, which denote yourself. The problem with these powerful words is it's like they each have a light side and a dark side. So let's look at the light side and dark side of each. We'll start with the word I, or me, or my, or mine, or any of those pronouns. They're sometimes known in uh, language as the first person. So the light side of I and me and mine, using these words effectively and properly, is when you use them to take responsibility for things that properly belong to you. I fear that this might happen. I take responsibility for this mistake. Using the word I or me or my or mine to take proper responsibility is enormously powerful. But there's a dark side to those pronouns too. The dark side is when you use them to take something which the other person may not think is properly yours. Well, I think this is the right way to do it. This is what I need to get out of the transaction. That creation was mine. 
I came up with those ideas. All of those things come across as selfish, and therefore I refer to them as the dark side of the first person. And just like the first person pronouns, I, me, my, and mine, the third person pronouns of you, your, yours, they too each have a light side and a dark side. When you're talking to somebody and you address them directly, what the project can do for you, how you are affected by the things that are going to happen, when you use you respectfully to properly allocate things to the other person, then that's the light side. They will light up because they'll know that you are addressing them directly and they'll feel properly respected. But on the dark side, when you use these words in an accusatory or disrespectful manner, you said this, or it's your fault. That makes people feel disrespected, blamed. It makes them feel intimidated, possibly even diminished. And that will make your difficult conversation even harder. So think about the light side and the dark side of the way that you use pronouns. Tip number five is to remember that the behavior is not the same as the person. What we do may say something about us in the moment, but it doesn't necessarily say something about us as a person. Long term patterns of behavior may indeed indicate the sort of person we are, but one misstep, we all do it. It's perfectly OK to deprecate bad behavior, discourtesy, disrespect, rudeness in someone you're talking with. But never stop respecting the person for who they are. Recognize that we do not always act properly on our intentions. We may intend to be courteous and respectful, but in the heat of a difficult conversation, we may come across as less than ideally respectful. We make mistakes. And if you can see through those mistakes, then you can carry your conversation forward, continuing to respect the other person. And remember that the position people will argue for isn't necessarily their deep interest in the situation. It's just what they think their interest is. Your job in any difficult conversation, whether it's conflict resolution or whether it's a negotiation or whether it's a reprimand of some kind, is to find out what really matters to them, what the outcomes are that will make them happy and give them the rewards they need and work towards those. To see through their position and also to recognize that your position the position that you're taking may not fully represent your own interests, especially if you haven't taken to heart tip one and thought very carefully about your outcome from the outset. These five tips are inspired by our Kindle exclusive ebook on challenging communication for project managers. I do recommend that you check it out. It covers everything we've talked about and a lot more. It gives you a detailed process for planning and structuring a complicated conversation and more. It has five chapters and the first chapter is managing difficult conversations, a guide for project managers. The second chapter is about managing conflict, everything a project manager needs to know. And we follow that in chapter three with a part two, which is about ways to get conflict and conflict management right. Chapter four is a guide to negotiation. Don't lose when you can win. And chapter five is about how coaching skills will make you a better project leader. Challenging Communications is available in the Kindle store. You'll find it uh, on the Amazon website in every uh, region where Amazon is represented. It's priced very economically. Do take a look at it. Project management technology is moving fast, but it's a fair bet that most of us will still be using email.
for a fair few years to come. So it's worth looking at any research that we can find that will help us to make the best use of this essential technology. So that's what we'll do in this video. A team at the University of Southern California and Yahoo Labs analyzed 16 billion email communications between 2 million users. Here's what they found. 1. Don't be offended by a terse reply. More than half of their responses had fewer than 43 words. And the most likely length? Five words. The commonest length of all. Number two, if you want the quickest response, send your email on a weekday and send it in the morning. They also found that replies take longer the older the person you send it to. Younger people reply quicker and their responses are more terse. Number three, ask yourself if you really need to attach anything to that email, because if your email has an attachment, it can double the length of time it takes to get a reply. So for small attachments, why not embed the content of the attachment into the email? Number four, in a series of emails, you'll start to notice that the gap between sending your email and receiving your response will get longer. That signals that to the other person, your series of communications is coming to an end. Number five, if you want a long reply, send your email on Monday. Because past Wednesday and reply lengths drop off rapidly, only to jump back up again on Monday morning. Number six, you'll get the longest replies early in the morning. The length of replies will drop steadily throughout the day to reach a minimum at around 11 p.m and then they'll jump back up again around 5 a.m. in the morning. Perhaps it's not surprising that the slowest replies are those to emails sent between 4 and 6 a.m. in the morning. And number seven, as people's email load increases, the proportion of emails they reply to starts to fall off. So if you need to send a message to someone who you know is a very heavy email user, to increase your chance of a reply, try to find another way to get a message to them. So to conclude, send your emails early in the morning, but after 6 a.m. Send them at the start of the week. Avoid attachments if you can, and don't take offense at a terse response. And finally, consider alternative modes of communication with heavy email users. Please give us a thumbs up if you like this video. There'll be loads more videos for project managers to come. So please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell so you don't miss any of them. And I'll look forward to seeing you in the next one.